So we so got a question out there, Cassandra, from Justin McAfee. He says, does it boil down to price always, or is it the inability to make your company unique? Oh, Mr. Andrew Teal, do you want to answer that? Or Mr. <laughs> I, and for those of you who don't know, Andrew Teal is very famous in Madropolis. No, I'm not. Um, and he's the yeah, absolutely the not. Curtain. He's actually the person he says, and we, we do what he says. I just want everybody to know that. And, uh, but Andrew has worked in every position possible, I think, in this industry. He's been a truck driver. He's worked for shipper. He's worked for logistics. He's worked for trucking companies. He's done everything. So, Andrew, what is your answer? I was even a service writer. I was in JD's world for two years. Uh, so I had a lot of that one-on-one, -on -one, face to face with uh, owner-operators with one truck, owner-operators, so to speak, that have, you know, that, that average uh, ATA 10 truck fleet, things like that. So I think Chris kind of hit on something. We talk about rate transparency and, and overhead transparency. And I know when it was time to roast brokers, it was, well, <laughs> you shouldn't take more than 10%. I, I want to know what the shipper's paying and then it's 10% from that. Um, and, and I saw that in a lot of different places on social media and it's like, okay, in that 10%, I need to do those things, which is to cultivate relationships so I can continue to get you good freight um, and as a carrier, and, and I do say this, and Cassandra's right, I, I still hold a valid commercial driver's license. I'm a fourth generation truck driver. I've lived that life. I've been in Ingrid's seat. I know what that means. But what you have done when you go to a broker or you go to a load board or anything like that is you're outsourcing your sales department. You're saying this person's going to go out there and find me the things I need to do to facilitate my business, which is to move freight. So at the end of the day, it really shouldn't be a shock that, hey, I'm not getting all of that all the time you mm. paid for a service more or less right mm. and it's the same with a factoring company yes. and it's the same with all the different things that that carriers use to get through you know their week so at the end of the week they get their settlement check is hey this is a lot smaller than i thought it was as well hey my factoring company took a chunk um you know i'm using a broker maybe i, I wouldn't normally use or whatever so i didn't get as great of a rate and things like that those are all things that people are performing for you so that is that's that's part of that conversation and to just say well you're allowed to have 10% or you're not allowed to have 10%. I, I don't think that's a constructive conversation to have and it shouldn't even be on the table. I think we need to get past that. I think as an industry, we need to say, hey, um, I will try to do my best to stick with you, but if I don't have the freight, I don't have the freight. I would love to give you more freight. I just don't have it right now. Yeah. Hey, I've got a ton of freight. I gave you everything I had before. How can you help me take care of all this freight I got sitting on my dock? I have a question for the three of you, Todd, Chris Jolly, and Andrew Teal. Um, and you guys can decide who goes first, but let's put shippers on the hot seat. I'm scared that when the rates dipped, our shippers would take their contracted freight, their contracted lanes that they told us we would have that we were awarded, and they would take them back. And then they would push them out into the spot market. We And it's then a, yeah, when it's rates <laughs> tightened, and they started increasing, shippers were like, listen, you got this contract. Remember that contract you signed, Chris Jolly? You got to pay yeah. that shit ass rate and take a bath. Good talk so, to you. <laughs> I, I've, had, I've had that. They, they use a fancier term. It's called a, a seasonal rebid, um, you know, due to- Oh my God, they have a term for it, Chris? Of course they do. Of course they do. Um, I, I, but I've been, on the, I've been on both sides of it where they have forced it because there was a, a, a major market shift on both ends though. If it's flipped to where it's like, hey, we don't want our providers taking a bath on everything. We know what's out there. We, our analysts have done that research. So it is, you know, it, 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 we preach on this all the time. Mm -hmm. Communication, communication, communication. You are your shippers, eyes and ears to the market. You need to bring this to them. Otherwise, you know what? They might not know. And guess what? You're one of five to seven providers as a broker. If all seven of you are saying the exact same thing, they will listen. You have to pick up the phone and make those phone calls though. You can't talk to your associates about why this customer just doesn't realize what the market's doing right now. Have that conversation. I don't, I don't think we can lose sight too of, I, I, I totally agree with that. We can't lose sight though of the economic um, impacts on the people we define as the shipper today, right? So the, the higher levels, the economic buyers have these um, accountability metrics on the people we interact with and we can sell to them all the time of what's happening in the market. But then the economics of the company start to take hold and can only uh, manage that relationship so much. And so I think I, 
I, every, I agree with like every, almost everything that's been said around communication, relationships, et cetera, but I feel like it's treating the symptoms and the problem stems back to market dependencies. As long as we're dependent on the market, we're going to continue to have these surrounding problems, right? You look at dedicated, you don't have that because the economics are built around, the pricing structures are built around the freight and there's more consistency there. Todd, in dedicated, they're not taking their freight back. The shippers aren't taking it back when it's cheaper and pushing it out to spot market. No, because it's, it's, it's committed. Now there's fluctuations within the demand from like DC to store, but they're not pushing that out to the spot market. They might have to influx and, and add some capacity, but it's, it's built on a, a more consistent uh, volume. And so in essence, the RFP process is meant to build the, build the church for Easter, right? And then they expect the carrier to house or pay for those seats that aren't being used and manage that, that cost without then trying to make up for it in the spot market. And so that goes to you, Todd. So it's, it's to you, Cassandra, but it goes to what Todd's saying. Abby says out here, it'd be interesting to see who is taking losses for customers right now to honor their commitments on their contractual mm. freight and who is declining loads to avoid big losses. Mm. Yep. It goes along with what you're saying there, Todd. She, she's she's kind of thinking on that line of a lot of people are talking, but who's actually putting forth the work to protect their clients? Deal. Absolutely. It, it, so I, and I, I'm on the carrier side now with a brokerage, grew up in brokerage for 11 and a half years. And it's like, I've seen both sides of that. And, and the challenge is on the macro level, we're trying to reach an earnings or margin percentage and have no idea what the true underlying volumes are going to be, right? Because the awarded actual volumes don't, aren't, aren't consistent to what the RFP stated. And so then we're trying to make decisions on the spot market that are trying to support what's going to happen down the road or what did happen. Um, but it often comes, to, it's relationship specific. I know which customers I have a relationship with that are going to honor their commitments. In which case, if I'm going to last as a carrier or a broker, I'm going to honor my commitments to them and lose money or invest yeah. in the relationship. I've seen it happen all the time. Yeah. But I, like, it, go ahead. Like Andrew, uh, Andrew Teal is our, is our resident shipper and he's always teaching us. And Andrew knows this because he's also been a broker and a carrier. But brokers and carriers, we take baths mm -hmm. on, on rates. We, yep. And many of them plan it, by the way. Like Ron has always told us, and Teal has said this too, is that we know these seasons are going to come, minus COVID drama. We know the seasons are going to come. So many are planning for take a bath at a certain time of the year. What is a bath, Cassandra? It's like we're going to lose money. We know when rates get really high and the shippers in the summer uh, who are moving energy drinks or yep. alcohol, they are going to want you to honor those prices. You know you're going to be at a loss. Yep. And that's what the good brokers do is they aggregate the smaller capacity and they also smooth the pricing for the shipper. And in which case then the carrier's or driver's side is riding the waves that the broker's managing. But the, the buy side on the, the, the broker side is often flat is from an RFP process for the most part. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what do you think about all this? I, I agree. I mean, especially with what Todd has mentioned and things like that. We talk about protecting, you know, I have seen both from shippers. I've seen shippers that are, are really data savvy and they understand that it's not about taking, hey, I did a thousand loads this month divided by 22 working days. Therefore, I have X number of loads per day and then just put that out there as an RFP. That doesn't work. Because you know what? I ship heavy Monday, Wednesday, and, and, and Saturday, let's say. So as a carrier, being on the carrier side, well, how do I solve for that? If I don't know that's coming, how do I solve my inbound? So I make sure I'm meeting that award uh, every day of the week, but it really only seems to happen Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. So I kind of solve for that. And then all of a sudden it turns around and you get a seasonal spike. And, and then the shipper says, well, on Thursday, you didn't have the eight trucks you said you would have. Mm -hmm. Well, because you've always been Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Saturday, you know, and, and Todd is exactly right, is we're all trying to skim across the top of the waves and, and kind of average and, and averages of averages suck, but we're trying to average everything out from a shipper perspective. Um, if you think about, say, a toilet paper shipper, uh, when COVID hit, they probably weren't anticipating the level of demand. They've never seen that level of demand that they saw in the second week through the fourth week of March, yeah. doing the best they can, right? Hmm. But you have to have that understanding then of, hey, look, I'm doing the best I can with forecasting my numbers. And when I call you and say, hey, I need a truck, and, and you said you would always have a truck for me and you don't, 
I'm not angry with you. It's not personal. It's just like, I'm doing the best I can. I know you're doing the best you can. And we talk about relationships. We talk about co uh, communication. Um, but a lot of times, you know, as, as others have said, is you don't really know until it happens. And that's hard. And when you're trying, in, in, in my perspective, um, and, and just where I am now, and, and not mentioning companies, but we have a lot of volume, which means I need to be able to execute that volume easiest for my business. And sometimes that means, look, if you can't take it today, tell me when you can take it. Don't just walk away. I can't take it today. I can take it tomorrow. Oh, great. I can work with my customer. The problem comes in is when the carrier says, uh, no, I'm just not doing it. And then I go out to DAT and I see that truck posted mm -hmm. on a load board in the same town where I need them to pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then that's where the hurt feelings come in. And that's when it does become a little personal, both sides, all sides. I get that. Um, and you know what? People have memories. People remember. People understand. They, they know things are business, but on the other hand is, it, and it's different for everybody. When does it stop becoming business and it starts to feel like you're just kind of kicking me? Yeah. And that goes from three months True. ago to what's going on to today. That's mm -hmm. Are you just kind of kicking me? I mean, I'm just kind of kicking me. I, I get it. I get it. You felt bad because you didn't get everything you wanted from me three months ago. I didn't have it to give you. Jesus. I want to do business because you know what? If you're moving my freight, I made a sale somewhere, somewhere else, right? That's revenue to me. That I mean, freight is a cost center. I get that, but it's revenue. It's I'm moving a load because somebody out there said, hey, I need your stuff. I want to move it. I want to make that person happy. So they call me tomorrow and say, Hey, I need your stuff. And I get to call you tomorrow and say, Hey, I need your truck. And that's how uh, this Andrew, works. Andrew, Greg Ackner had a story here and I wanted to get your perspective. I want to get Cassandra's perspective on it. Both of you guys perspective. Greg said, Hey, I regularly, regularly lose good Lord over a thousand dollars per load for a regular loyal client out of Georgia, April through June. Then he said, at the end of the year, we net 15% off the account. Northside happy. Loads loads loaded on time. Yeah. So, like, kind of talk about that, Greg, because Andrew's a shipper. Cassandra's on the council side. So, they, they both look at losses. They both try to figure out what is profitable and what isn't profitable and why should we take this loss or this bad. So, talk about what you're talking about there, Greg, and how it ends up being positive at the end of the year. So... You know, one of the things, one of the perspectives I try to take is a lot of people are looking day to day. They're living in a day to day world or they're living in a week to week environment. Um, and that could be any number of reasons why, why they're doing so is because maybe they don't have a good relationship with that customer who's not regularly giving them freight or they don't have a contract, so to speak, with that customer where you make a commitment, they make a commitment back to you. So, you know, there's a lot of things that, that can come into play with that, you know, but the biggest thing that I try to establish with my customers and our carriers, which I'm not as much on the carrier side, I'm mostly on the customer side, but the biggest thing we try to establish is setting a precedent before you go into new business. So you understand what, what is going to happen down the road. Customers that we do business with, now for us, we're only a reefer broker. I don't touch dry freight. So I feel the swings up and down a lot more. I feel capacity tight in certain areas a lot more. Typically, the people that we're doing business with, they're that savvy and they understand their own business within those markets. So going into those negotiations or going into those contract talks, bid season, whatever it may be, we, both sides kind of know the fluctuations. Both sides know the volatility going into it. So you have that conversation. What you're seeing and what we're dealing with a lot out there, especially when I'm trying to compete with people that are just destroying my rates by 2 $3 a mile, is they don't have that knowledge. They go in, get the volume, attack, attack, attack. Then when all of a sudden it hits Georgia in June, you see these tender rejections left and right. Next thing you know, the shippers that we were telling we were going to do X, Y, and Z for are coming back calling us mm -hmm. saying, hey, can you do it for this rate? Well, no, now I can't because I didn't get time to establish the carrier base. I don't have a carrier base. So I'm just like you going out to the DAT and I'm going to do what I did. Is that making sense to y'all too? Cassandra? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you see it, and it's and you brought up a great point about trying to live day to day, and we're making too many decisions that way. It's it's a reason why it's called a quarterly business review. Yeah. I'm going to look at the last three months, and I want to see where I averaged out, and I'm going to see from the carrier side. Hey, did your volume actually materialize? Let's have a conversation. Why did it? Why didn't it? From the shipper side, hey, I awarded you ten loads per day. 
Um, you said that's what you wanted in the award, but you gave me four trucks. What happened? Oh, I lost my inbound. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Right. Or did you really lose your inbound? Because you know what? When that truck, when you turn that truck down at that tender, and now I'm, I'm scrambling or whatever, and all of a sudden, I get a call from somebody else in your business on your brokerage side that says, hey, we got a truck that can pick that up. Or somebody else that says, I can grab that at a spot rate. For those of you who haven't heard Andrew a couple times say as a shipper. I lost my inbound. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Right. Or did you really lose your inbound? What because is he you doing? Nice deal? We, like almost at the same time? At that time. Uh, here, I'll just mute people because I don't know who that echo is from. Um, so what Andrew was saying, though, that was interesting is that he's paying attention. He knows where his freight is. That was one thing I caught in between. Uh, what he was sending. But hold on one minute. I want to give everybody a LinkedIn because I see our numbers start to spike and do weird things. I think people are getting off work a little bit more. No. So here in 10 minutes, I'm going to cut off the feed from <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send stuff back to them. You know Chicken what? down. <laughs> All right, people. Focus on I'm LinkedIn. Good. I'm going to cut you off. You got to go to YouTube. And if you want to participate, you go to Zoom. But go to YouTube, people. I'm sick of LinkedIn right now because it's giving me a hard time. I can see it. Have you seen it, JD? It's been giving us a hard no, time. I'm looking at it now, but there's a good question on LinkedIn. I think it's directed at Teal. It says, people need to understand that big box retailers are the ones that are actually bottoming out the rates. That's from Anthony Dunham. Oh, Tony, a resident shipper. Go ahead, Greg. Before I mean, I, wait, who was that question for? Was that for Teal? Look at you smiling. Thank you for everybody. Honestly. Yeah, I, I, what's the question, I guess? And I'm not being snarky. I'm just saying, I, under, I mean... Volume will always dictate. No. Oh, go ahead, sir. One point real quick on what we were speaking about earlier is something that I don't know if it was mentioned or not. If it was, I'm sorry. But when you're looking at it from that daily, weekly, monthly standpoint, you also have to understand how that person on the other end of the line is being compensated. Because you're working for a big broker. You're making money that paycheck for that week on that mm -hmm. load. And I'm not taking that load if I'm losing a thousand dollars and then I got to go explain mm. to my boss why I can't make commission on it because they don't understand the seasonality or give a crap about the seasonality to begin with. So, and then secondly, to the big box driving down rates, yes, they're savvy. Yes, they're smart. Yes, they can do that. But those that understand the value of on time percentages and understand in full loads sealed intact, they will pay up. We deal with, yeah. we deal with those big box stores. They for sure pay up. Do the Andrew, do the big box stores are like what are we talking about? Like Walmart? Are they controlling the entire market, Andrew? Sure. I, I I think anytime you have um, how do you put it? The, who's ever in that particular market that drives volume, right? So if I'm talking uh, a, a small market where the only DC there is Walmart, then yeah, they're pretty much setting the tone for what inbound rates are gonna look like into that that region. Or from a, a lack of a better term, sometimes the outbound rates because you can either get loaded at that particular DC again and, and bounce out, or you got to go to a neighboring market. I do, I always struggle with the idea of hey the 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 top mega carriers, which you know the top 100 carriers control all the rates, or the 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 top 500 shippers control everything. Um, there's a, a a company I won't name names that has looked at this. They they published a white paper on it. I looked at it with my limited statistical analysis is the top 100 carriers move about 5% of the freight in this country. Yeah. So if you that. really think that 5% is controlling the other 95%, why, why do you want to participate is what I would ask. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to participate in something that you firmly believe is that slanted against you? And it goes kind of the same way with, with the shippers, right? There's a lot of shippers out there. Um, you know, we're a high volume shipper. It, you know, we hear it, hey, market dynamics. If you're not going to pay it, the next guy will. It's kind of the same thing. If if you're not going to haul my freight for $1.85 a mile, the next guy will, you know, and then, or whatever that looks like. So I, can, I think it's valid. You can argue too right now that a lot of the issues that's taking place in our market or ecosystem is people's lack of understanding of macro and microeconomics. Exactly. Now, I've had that conversation with folks of, of well, how long is this going to last? I said, well, what's spot price right now in China to the West Coast on a container ship? Oh, why do I need to know that? Well, 
our economy, for better or worse, runs on 70% consumerism, which means, especially right now, consumer products and retail, a lot of that still comes from China. So if spot rates are really high coming across the water, that means there's a lot of demand yet for whatever available capacity is still there, even po post-COVID, which means it's all going to hit Southern California, which means it's got to get inland from somewhere, even if it stays in Southern California, even if it stays there and it just goes to a DC and people are sitting on it waiting like, sooner or later it's going to turn and, and this is my Christmas goods or, or whatever. Um, as long as those spot rates are high, I know that there's going to be a lot of trucking demand in California. And as California goes, typically the West goes. And then as the West goes, everybody in the East, it's, it's a water in a bathtub. If I'm in the East and rates are really good at West, I'm going to take a cheap lane and I'm going to run out West and I'm going to sit and run out of Southern California as long as I can, because yeah, they are getting fat cash Me too. and all well, that water sloshes over to the West coast. Yeah, and then that goes away. Be why, because it's, getting, why, why is it outbound California is so crazy right now? What is it? Explain to the viewers who don't know what you mean by that. So you have all this freight hitting the California ports out of China, all the stuff that everybody's buying right now, because you know what? I can't hop on a plane and go to Disney world. I can't do all this stuff. So I'm sitting on Amazon. I'm sitting on Instacart. I'm sitting on Walmart plus whatever. And I'm buying stuff instead of the $7,000 I was going to spend this year in Disney world, or it's probably a lot more than that. I don't know. I don't go to Disney world, but instead of spending all that money or, or things like that is, you know what, I'm going to make myself feel better. I'm going to order some, some goods. And those, those retail consumer product goods, a lot of that comes from California because it comes out of China. It comes out of the Asian the Pacific Rim and that's where they land in this country. So you've got all this demand. It, it's very simple supply and demand. I've got all of this demand for trucking out of California because I've got all this freight sitting on my dock that I need to go out and sell and make up for the absolute horrible Q2 I had if I'm, you know, yep. Gap or, or, or a, a, a uh, consumer products, whatever. Q2 sucked. Nobody was going to the mall and buying my stuff. I need to make up for that because you know what? At the end of the year, Q3, and I got to go to the stock market and say, this is what I did. And then my stock tanks or it goes up and that affects my ability to one, remain employed or to reinvest into my business. That's important. It is where we get the opportunity to pick a shipper's brain. Um, often they're, <laughs> they're, to be honest, often uh, they are so overworked and their companies don't let them <laughs> Uh, speak out as much as they can and they just don't have the freedom that a lot of people do so i'm guys, on vacation today we have andrew T. <laughs> we have a very rare moment where we have a major shipper who's also completely understands our industry so if you have questions put them